Hi, John, and thank you very much for joining us today. 2023 was a breakout year for uranium with much of that move coming in the last few months of the year. And I always like to start our conversations the same way to get an update on the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. When you and your team took it over in July of 2021, the NAV was only 600 million, 18 million pounds of uranium. Where is it now? Yeah, hey, Jimmy, good to see you. Um, it's, it's hard to believe that we're two and a half years uh, into the life of our, our of SPUT, and um, we're about 6.7 billion. So the fund has grown by a multiple of about 10. And I think even more interesting is it's now SPUT's single largest fund, which is uh, pretty astonishing. So we're we're obviously very pleased. The fund recently was at all-time highs. Uh, I think it's fair to say our, our investors are very pleased with the performance. Um, and you know we have some investors that were very early uh, in this trade and. Some of them are up 3x on their money, which has been great. So that's an interesting point. It's your single largest fund now, so that means it overtook the gold fund. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, obviously, the gold fund's been around since 2010, um, and the gold fund is is very near and dear to our heart. But uranium has really been the the star of the last uh, 12 months or so, uh, with you know an 89% gain last year and. You know, only partway through January, the fund is up another 15%. So the momentum continues. Uh, there's lots of uh, lots of interest, growing interest uh, for sure. People are very curious about you know why this particular commodity is doing so well when many other commodities are hitting multi-year multi-year lows. And uh, we've been incredibly busy in terms of engaging with institutional investors uh, over the last five or six weeks. Uh, and I just came back from from Europe where I traveled to. London, Milan, and Zurich, and, and met with 36 different uh, funds there that are, some of them are, are learning about uranium, some of them are existing investors in the sector and wanted updates. And uh, there's still a lot of interest and, and excitement, even though we've hit 100 bucks. And you know, you would think, well, you know, the price has hit 100 bucks. Surely people are taking profits and moving on, or they think they've missed it. I would say it's, it's very different. Um, as the price goes up, it really helps to validate the thesis it, as the price has gone up, it also has made the sector more investable in terms of size and liquidity. Um, and I think the reality is there's always more momentum-oriented investors in the world than value investing, which is obviously very difficult to be contrarian, particularly when sectors are, are deeply out of favor, like uranium was you know, from 2011 right through to, to 2020. I do want to ask you about that marketing trip, but before we do that, I want to continue on with uh, a discussion on the flows. And so a lot of money has flown into the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. What about the Uranium Miners ETF or URNM? Yeah, well, we've seen a really interesting rotation uh, with our business, uh, specifically with respect to uh, a disproportionate share of inflows have actually gone into our Uranium Mining ETFs over the last six months. Uh, that's a really healthy sign because it, it basically reflects, I think, growing interest in the space. It also reflects uh, institutional investors and retail investors that are more willing to get exposed to the, to the miners, which we know are more volatile and less liquid, but do provide a lot of that operating leverage for the producers and, and near-term producers, as well as optionality uh, for, for a lot of the developers and explorers. So, um, we've seen this kind of shift back to the miners. Remember, the miners really got ahead of themselves uh, in the fourth quarter of, of 2021. That's when kind of the Reddit mob kind of got a hold of the uranium story and pushed a lot of those stocks to, to levels uh, that were, were not sustainable. And over that period, you know, the commodity price kept marching higher and the stocks kind of did not keep pace. But we, see, we saw this rotation starting to emerge in July of last year where the uranium stocks started to perform better, and as a result, we've seen larger flows into our uranium mining ETFs around the world than we've had in the physical uranium trust, which is three times the size. So I think that's a very good indication that interest is, is broadening back to the equities, and it's not just one stock, uh, because we know last year a lot of those gains was driven by a single name. We've definitely seen a widening of interest and a, and a, a greater breadth of performance across the, the small and mid-cap names in the space. That's an interesting point because even though the, the spot is making uh, new highs, 
or you know multi-year highs, the a lot of the equities are not factoring in this higher spot price. So you're you're seeing a closing of that valuation gap. Yeah, we've definitely seen better relative performance from the miners, um, and not and as I said, not just one name, but greater breadth of performance, and that is obviously I I think helping to encourage more capital flows into those products. Um, our uranium mining ETF is is uh, about 1.8, 1.9 billion right now, um, and our junior fund is around 250 million. And our European version of our uranium mining fund has broken through 300. So uh, somebody recently told me that Sprott, when you add up all of our exposure in uranium mining ETFs, that we're the single largest holder of uranium mining stocks in the world, which I had no idea about. But um, so we now have the largest physical uranium trust, and now we and we have uh, the most exposure to uranium mining stocks in the world. So it's it, pretty impressive. I think it's about nine billion U.S. dollars altogether. So I want to move on and discuss the, the spot market. There's a lot of tightness or there appears to be a lot of tightness just due to geopolitical concerns and also supply disruptions coming, coming out of Kazataprom and also Cameco. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? Yeah, well, I think it really kicked off um, in August. That, that's when we saw the, 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 the I think, the, the most recent inflection point. And, and that's when the price kind of broke out of this range that we were we were in, in around the mid 50s per pound. Um, and we know we started off September at $60 and everybody was kind of scratching their head saying, you know, why, why was the price so firm in, in the month of August, which is typically very quiet. And, you know, we started to, to, to find the reasons why when, when Cameco signaled they were having some, some, some short term production issues at mine and mill. Um, and obviously the, the momentum carried through right through to the fall. You know, we hit $72 and people might say, well, what's the significance of $72? Well, it was the price of uranium right before the earthquake and tsunami in Japan in 2011. So when we broke that, that threshold, you know, that was finally getting through another psychological barrier for investors. And it wasn't too far uh, after that, that the Kazakhs announced that they were going to flex up production in both 24 and 25. And we saw the price of uranium fall $5 a pound very quickly, back to $67. But within a week or so, it was like right through 72 again. I think that reflects a couple things. One, there was some skepticism in the market whether they can actually achieve that. And obviously, in the last couple of weeks, we've got some, some, some confirmation from them that they are probably not going to hit their number. And we've also had very strong underlying demand. We see utilities back in the spot market last year. We've seen producers in the spot market last year. You know, we were in the spot market, albeit at a much further reduced level than the two prior years. I think it's very important to remind uh, the audience that, you know, last year we bought 4 million pounds of uranium, which is really not a whole lot of material, and yet the price went up 89%. So who's who's really driving the price? Well, it's end users, uh, in our, our belief, in both the spot market buying what they could find, and obviously the term market, had a very substantial year, but if you you know pull back the layers of the term market last year, you know it was about 160 odd million pounds were contracted. But when you pull out what the Ukrainians purchased, which is 60 odd million pounds, I think the rest of the industry is still not at replacement rate contracting. So we still think there's more room for this for the uh, long-term contracting cycle to accelerate particularly amongst U.S. utilities who have been dragging their feet in terms of buying more uranium. We don't know why. Um, the European utilities have been more proactive, and uh, we think this year is going to be kind of a catch-up year for U.S. utilities to, to buy more. You mentioned that in 2023, Sprott only purchased 4 million pounds. Can you put that into perspective for us? What, how does that compare to 2022? Yeah, sure. So in, in 22, I think we purchased uh, approximately 20 million pounds. So um, it was just a fraction. And, you know, it's interesting to me uh, also to note is, you know, we had the we had spot go up 82 percent last year in performance. Yet the total flows for the entire year were 400 million dollars. You know, I'm not going to belittle 400 million dollars, but in the grand scheme of asset flows around the world, it's really a drop in the bucket for an asset that went up 82 percent in a year where returns were very hard to find. So I think it, it's reflective of, we're still at a stage where we don't have 
investors trampling over themselves to get in, in, in position in the sector, we still do not have the big journalist money there. We still have, you know, kind of the small and mid-sized institutions that I think, you know, have been the most proactive in terms of getting position the last three years. Um, and, and that's another reason why I don't think the, the trade is crowded by any means, because we have not seen, you know, a wave of new capital come in, into the sector relative to other asset classes. And so that's a good overview of what you're seeing and hearing in the, the spot market. What about the contracting market? Can you give any insights on that? Yeah, I think I think this year um, we're hopeful, anyways, that that we break through the 160 mark. I think ultimately what everybody is 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 expecting that over the next few years that the contracting cycle will continue. It'll be it'll be very healthy, and that we really need to get back to levels where utilities are buying you know 200 million pounds and above, which is really indicative of them reloading inventories and them building you know restocking. Uh, future fuel supplies. We're not there yet. We're, we're just kind of treading water. If you look at the last cycle in the mid 2000s, there were years where the industry was buying upwards of 250 million pounds per year on long-term contracts. That obviously collapsed um, after 2011 and averaged about 70 million pounds per annum over a 10 year period. Um, and so, you know, that's a period of destocking and I think what's happening, what's why we've gone from kind of 70 to 120 to 160 million pounds is just a, a function of time. Uh, inventories have drawn down. Um, it's just natural for utilities to draw down inventory over time as they consume it. Second of all, I think there's a change in mindset that now security of supply is becoming more important because of potential supply disruptions, because you know some producers are having issues in terms of restarting mines or expanding existing ones. Obviously, there's still this lingering concerns about, you know, potential geopolitics and, and, and trade wars and whatnot, uh, further entangling or complicating the, 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 the nuclear fuel supply chain. There's obviously a bill that's waiting to get approved in the U.S. Senate that could uh, ban the importation of Russian enriched uranium uh, but, uh, and, and, and allow for a certain waiver process for the next few years, but there's a lot of uncertainty around how that is going to operate, the time, the, the the waiver process, and then the wild card is always will the Russians retaliate and cut the West off from enriched uranium before the uh, the hard deadline of uh, December 31st, 2027. So I think all of these things have changed the psychology and the mindset of the fuel buyers. They're very focused on ensuring they have long-term supply. I think it's pretty well known in the industry that the top producers have essentially sold out all their production for the for, for the next few years. I think if I was a fuel buyer and I called some of the largest producers and I get a response that, hey, I'm sold out for the next four years, wouldn't make me feel like we're in a, we remain in a period of, bl of plentiful supply, which they had become incredibly accustomed to for the greater part of the last 10 years as we were, re you know, working down a lot of excess inventory. So, I think the psychology has changed. You know, at the end of the day, the fundamentals haven't changed at all because we knew there was a supply gap three years ago, five years ago, and today. So what's changed? Well, it's, I think it's the mindset more than anything, the psychology of the market. You raised an interesting point there about Russia and whether or not they might use the leverage that they have because they're they're so big into enrichment and conversion services. And that's an interesting point if they were to weaponize that and in the impact it would have on the markets. Yeah, and I think it's it's something obviously nobody is 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 wanting to play out because it will be uh disruptive and the sector has been faced with a, a number of challenges since the war broke out. But if if that were to play out, obviously you just don't know because it's gonna be a very um, psychologically driven event, but it, it could create a short-term calamity in the market. Uh, we obviously think it would it would spike the price of U308. Uh, again, we're not predicting it, but it's something that we everybody's watching for. Interesting points. So let's talk about your marketing trip to Europe that you uh, you mentioned or you touched on earlier. You went to three cities and you saw 36 clients. Yeah, we uh, we just spent a, a week. Uh, we were hosted. Uh, by a bank, and uh, they they brought us around uh, in London and Milan and Zurich. Uh, you know, London for sure. Um, they're very up to speed with with the uranium. 
Um, Continental Europe, I would say, is is further behind in terms of their understanding and their their positioning in the sector. So we tend to do more, uh, you know, kind of education and 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 um, kind of research, uh, help them through their research process. But you know, there's I think you know the fundamentals are very appealing. They're very interesting. But there's also this stigma, uh, this legacy stigma about investing in the sector is clearly fading away. It's not universal. There are still pockets in continental Europe that are still, a, we, we're not allowed to invest in this sector, which I think is very antiquated and unfortunate. But you're, you, you know, we're just not getting the, the same kind of resistance that we would, that we would typically see, you know, two or three years ago in terms of, you know, is this a safe sector to invest in? Can I, you know, is it is it morally right to invest in the sector? I mean. I think attitudes are changing enormously. COP28, you know, the pledge by 20 plus countries to triple nuclear power, I think goes a long way in terms of reducing that stigma and, and, and getting past that legacy that we have with nuclear energy. Yeah, and, and I think a big part of it too is if you have a mandate to make money and this commodity is up 80 or 90 percent and every other commodity is down on there, you pretty well have to be there. Yeah, I think it's very hard to ignore. Um, people are looking for new investment ideas. This is this is something that I think is very unique. It fits a, in a whole bunch of different thematics for people. So it can fit within a decarbonization kind of trend. It can fit in an energy and energy security theme. Um, it is obviously a, the ideal complement to renewable energy, which most people have been invested in for the last 10 years, more downstream renewable energy, and that's had a really challenging uh, year or so. People have uh, not done well with those investments. So I think, you know, it fits in a whole bunch of different buckets. And maybe you can provide some more color on the, the meetings that you had. Were these long only clients? Were they hedge funds, retail, institutional? And are they new to the space or are they w uh, well acquainted with the space? Yeah, it was a really wide variety, um, and I think that's reflective of the growing interest in the, in the space. I would say over the last six months, we've had much uh, greater uh, number of inquiries from generalist investors. Um, they're, they're clearly doing their homework on the space and trying to figure out how this fits into their portfolio. But it's everything from family offices to small kind of boutique funds to very large you know, um, particular funds within very large asset managers, but it is not the Black Rocks of the world. They are not calling and saying, "Hey, we've got billions of dollars to deploy in this space." It's they're just not there yet. Um, the sector is obviously growing nicely. It's recapitalizing. Um, it's becoming more liquidity. And you know, with 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 all of these um, asset classes, you know, liquidity begets liquidity. So. We've been very focused on growing the vehicles because we know that's a key requirement to get more and more institutional participation. You know, it, it wouldn't, it, it wasn't uncommon to talk to institutions in Europe that said, look, we're not allowed to invest in anything under a $5 billion market cap. So when you think about that in the context of the uranium sector, you pretty much eliminated all but three or four things. So it's a pretty limited um, investment universe for some of these funds, but they'll come, you know, they will come in due course. Um, as the sector grows. But, you know, look, there's lots of capital out there. Uh, we remain very, very focused on educating the market about the sector uh, and helping investors understand how it works. John, before we wrap it up, I want to touch on a few other uh, news events that happened at Sprott, one of which was you were contemplating a redemption feature and you decided to not do that. Maybe you can provide the rationale for why you took that course. Yeah, sure. So in uh, September, we announced publicly that we were contemplating a limited redemption feature for the Sprout Physical Uranium Trust. You know, we were not happy with the way it was trading. We obviously hit some air pockets in a period in the summer where liquidity and market sentiment in general across the markets was soft. And so it was something we were entertaining. We collected feedback from a lot of institutions, and that was in September when the price was $60 a pound. Now, fast forward to the end of December. The price had kind of broken through 80 and, and working towards 90. And we just reflected on what's the likelihood that shareholders actually approve a proposal like this, which has a very high threshold. Two thirds of all the shares outstanding of the trust would actually have to vote and approve such a proposal. We think that's a very high hurdle 
to achieve given the change in the market dynamics and clearly the change in sentiment. So it's something we've decided to put on the back burner for now. That doesn't mean we won't uh, revisit it in the future if market conditions change. But for the time being, we have such a busy schedule at Sprott for the next six months in terms of events, conferences, and requests. We really want to focus all of our energy on that while the sector is, is, is really moving to the next stage of this bull market and not get distracted with a very cumbersome and expensive proxy process. Understood. And Sprott recently filed a $1.5 billion shelf. Maybe you can give us some color on that. Yeah, so we also announced in early January that we, we came to an agreement with our regulator. We renewed our shelf um, prospectus for one and a half billion US dollars. We then drew a billion of the billion and a half down off the shelf, so to speak, for the at the market uh, capital raising program. We've raised about 55 million uh, US dollars so far. And um, that program will last for 25 months. We've also made an agreement with our regulator that we would not purchase more than 9 million pounds of uranium in the spot market for the next two calendar years. This was a compromise to allow us to continue to operate the trust and to grow it while not, you know, overly overwhelming, let's say, the spot market in terms of our purchases. So we think this was a very fair compromise. Uh, gives us certainty and clarity around around how much capacity we have to work with. And to be totally candid, I think it's going to be very challenging even to find 9 million pounds in this market right now. And I'm sorry, I just want to clarify that. 9 million pounds in one year? Per calendar year, correct. Okay. Interesting, yeah. Okay, and is there anything else you want to highlight before we wrap it up? No, I would just say that... Um, you know that even though the 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 the, the price is broken out to a hundred dollars, I, I still think, and we still think that there's a lot of opportunity here because we look at the 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 supply deficit that the industry needs to solve for, and whether you take the base case or the more aggressive scenario, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half billion to two point three billion pounds of uncovered requirements that utilities have between now and 2040. The only way you solve for that is you need to basically double production globally between now and 2040, which is going to be a huge undertaking and is going to require very robust uh, uranium prices, not just for three months or six months and then it goes back to some other level. It's going to have to stay elevated for a very long period of time because of the, the, the long lead times and the large capex that's required to basically get these projects built. So we're very we're very optimistic that the prices are going to remain elevated for a, a, you know an extended period of time. We don't really see a catalyst that can knock this back. Uh, the world has clearly pivoted back to nuclear energy in most countries, um, and it's going to require massive investments as uh, as we want if we want to focus on these primary goals of decarbonization, energy security, and reliable baseload power to offset intermittency of renewables. These are the three fundamental drivers of why uh, energy policy has shifted back to nuclear energy. Great comments. And John, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. If someone would like to learn more about Sprott and its various products, where can they go? Yeah, so Sprott.com is probably the easiest point to start. We've got information about our funds. We've got a really great investor education section, which I would encourage people to spend some time reading reading about reading our reports um, we published a report in early january that i think is very timely we also published some really great podcasts with expert speakers in the sector um, and that will help you you know get a very good understanding of, of how the sector works um, and we have a, a a number of funds that you can kind of explore and, and understand well that's great once again thanks very much john thank you for having me always nice to talk to you